Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Their mission, operating public schools dedicated to the belief that all children can learn and succeed and that education can break the po cycle of poverty and accomplished through unique public-private partnerships. The results, 100% on-time graduation rate, 95% of graduates attend college, and 5% join the military. Their students score equally or better than top Virginia students on SOL tests. And now they are open in Virginia Beach. Up next on Another View, we're talking about an Achievable Dream Academy, right after this news from NPR. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. On today's show, we'll talk about the newest addition to the An Achievable Dream Academies, SeaTac Elementary Achievable Dream Academy in Virginia Beach. That discussion in just a moment. But first, before we do that, two things. One, I want to welcome to Another View. We've been watching, they're watching us do radio. Danita and Mark Lata from Atlantic City, friends of mine, and they came down to to spend some time in Virginia Beach. They've been having a great time, and I appreciate them coming up to watch the show with us today. So hi, Danita and Mark. Appreciate you all out there. Uh, the also, we have, speaking of Virginia Beach, an update on Africana Virginia Beach. It's the very successful three-day oceanfront celebration of family, culture, and entertainment of the African diaspora. So joining us by phone is Bruce Williams, a partner with Novacom, a Virginia Beach-based minority marketing firm, and the organizer of Africana Virginia Beach. Hi, Bruce. How are you? Hi, Barbara. How are you? I'm fine. That is such a title. Anyway. So <laughs> We got that as well. <laughs> so next weekend, we're going to do it again, huh? Next week, we're going to do it again. And this this time around, still people are asking us, Virginia Beach, you sure? They said, <laughs> when? How do we get there? Who's coming? What? Where, how can I get there? And and the excitement is, is tremendous. Fantastic. Well, for people who, who may not have known about the festival from our discussion last year, remind us again of the premise and what you hope to accomplish during those three days. Well, we hope to accomplish is threefold. One, uh, as Virginia Beach has had, uh, uh, back from the 89 area, a history of having been seeming to be unfriendly to African American people of color. Um, they were doing a Funk Fest as a two night, con a two night concert series to entertain for folks who were visiting the area. We partnered with the city and said we could do a weekend festival and change some perceptions and market this thing up and down the East Coast to what the beauty of the beach, and also use it as a backdrop to express all things African-based, and uh, that's where Africana comes from. And so last year we we, we ventured into an inaugural event with some trepidation because they had had some issues in April about the students coming down and whatnot, and mm -hmm. people still had to think. It was a fantastic success. 20,000 people came. Um, we had people come as far as Canada, um, oh, I talked to one sister that came out of Kansas City. She saw it on the internet. Um, the police department, the guys on the patrol, who I was there at two o'clock, talked to them. It was one of the friendliest crowds they worked with. Um, it was wonderful. Now it was a stretch for us because that was also the time of the march on Washington re-up, and so a lot of the things we did in hotel and whatnot were were not well was received because people were out of town. Mm -hmm. But the content was fantastic. But more importantly, people enjoyed themselves at the beach as families. We drew something like, uh, I mean, uh, the the largest group of people of any event had the largest groups of people coming. Ninety-eight percent said they wanted to come back. Um, and it was we had people, the largest group of people out of out of the area came from North Carolina, second largest from the DC metro, uh, DC metro. Okay, and most, Bruce, most of the um, activities that you have, including like historical uh, information and um, all kinds of activities, but they're all free, or or some are free and some aren't. Everything is free except for the day party, and if you want preferred seating, the day party is something new. They had a big slide on the sand that's gone, and we have programmed a chalet 
that we're going to have at 2 to 6 on Saturday. It's going to be a day party with old school dancing and a chance to network with friends and make new friends. And, you know, the free, free, uh, there'll be free drinks from Pepsi. But that, that has a charge. That's $10. Mm-hmm. But everything else is free. 26 performers uh, starting on Friday with the uh, Ubuntu dances opening up at 2 o'clock at the uh, Cox Culture Pavilion on 24th Street. And then that evening, Rose Rice, Saturday night, George Clinton, Parliament Funkadelic. All during the day, we've got Urban Arts and Pan Band. Uh, we got a new artist called Kenya. Um, it's a with Peggy Britt on Sunday, Sam Rucker on Sunday. We got the great Earl Carter playing on on Saturday, uh, DJing, and we got uh, African dancers. We may even have a visit from Sojourner Truth and Frederick Douglass. Wow, you got something for everyone. And Bruce, remind our listeners too that this is not a festival that is just for African Americans. Oh no! In fact, the young, the folks from Canada were were not. And if we when we looked at it, we found that people who enjoy First of all, all that R and B sound. Mm-hmm. Secondly, folks who were interested in really learning something about culture. The one of the biggest uh, exclusives that we had that was the most well received was the thirty panels that we put on the boardwalk called the Culture Walk. It went up on Wednesday and stayed up till Sunday, and people from all over the country, all ilks, all backgrounds and groups, got a chance to be exposed to some unique African history, African American history that. It gave them some insight, and so folks enjoyed it. Yes, it was for everybody. In fact, we want to try to expand that so folks get a true feeling of what our culture is like and its contributions. Okay, so tell us once again the dates, and um, and it's at the Virginia Beach Oceanfront, and the dates again? The dates are August the 22nd Mm -hmm. through August the 24th, and that's uh, next weekend. We're even asking people if they want to love it on Sunday, stay on Monday. (laughs) <laughs> um, we, we've got the day party. Uh, we've linked with uh, Teens with a Purpose. They're doing like a pre-event on Thursday at the at the, at the uh, MOCA. Okay. Is there a website for folks to go to so they oh, can find all the information? They should go to www.africanavirginiabeach.com. That's okay. africanavirginiabeach.com. We're also on Facebook. Uh Okay. The Dude Journal and Guide, they can find all the details. We've got great support from you and other press in the area. Fantastic, Bruce. Thanks so much for joining us, and uh, we wish you the very best this year with uh, Africana Virginia Beach. It's second year uh, here in our area. So hey, if tell you... your friends from Lansing, stay over. Stay okay. with you in the house. Come on this week. <laughs> I'll do that. Thanks so much for joining us, Bruce. You're welcome. That was Bruce Williams, one of the organizers of Africana Virginia Beach. And now to our other topic of the day, the brand new C- Tech Elementary and Achievable Dream Academy. It's a perfect fit to the WHRO WHRV multi year nationwide corporation for public broadcasting initiative called American Graduate Let's Make It Happen. Its goal is to improve on time graduation rates and lower dropout rates, a very similar goal of an Achievable Dream Academies. SeaTac Elementary and Achievable Dream Academy opened its doors on July 21st. The school is located in SeaTac, Virginia Beach, a historically African-American neighborhood with a very proud history. So why place an an Achievable Dream Academy there, and what do educators, parents, and the community members hope to accomplish? Joining us to talk about it is Kim Lucas, Vice President of Operations for an Achievable Dream Academies. Hi, Kim. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Mary Daniels, Principal of SeaTac Elementary and Achievable Dream Academy. Hi, Mary. How are you? Hi, Barbara. I'm doing well. How are you? Great. I'm fine. And James Lawson, a resident of SeaTac who has a student at the school. How are you, James? I'm great, Barbara. How about you? I'm fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us. And Mary, before we talk about an Achievable Dream Academy, you also have some friends in town. And they're they're here joining us with another view. You want to tell us who they are? Oh, sure. My sister is here with me today, Becky. Daniels okay. and a good friend Mary Lou. Oh, fantastic. Okay, well we <laughs> welcome them also to the show. So, 100% on-time graduation rate. Kim, I'm looking at you because with this Corporation for Public Broadcasting initiative that we have trying to bring that issue to the forefront, what are you doing differently that others aren't? It's the environment that we have with, for the students as they matriculate through an achievable dream. We believe that every child deserves a dream. So regardless of your uh, economic status, 
we provide the type of resources, the type of education. We call it same curriculum, social, academic, moral education. We touch the whole child. We believe in, in developing the whole child. We provide outside resources, so it's not just what happens within the classroom on a daily basis, it's also ensuring provide resources, provide activities outside of the classroom. It's a daily process. Um, uh, our children feel welcome. Our children are able to learn uh, social skills. Uh, we provide skills and curriculum and ethics in etiquette, in peaceful conflict resolution, mm -hmm. healthy living. Um, and we emphasize success. So every given day, a child who enters our schools understands that they can be successful. Now, the academy started in Newport News, yes. Walter Siegeloff. Um, it started out with a tennis match, basically. That's correct. And grew into, now you have two schools in Newport We News? have uh, two nationally recognized schools in Newport News. We have an academy, which is kindergarten through uh, fifth grade, and then we have middle and high school. Um, and we have been in Newport News since 1992, mm -hmm. and you are correct. It did start out as a tennis program and after-school program, but it grew. And from there, we, reali we realized that if we had an academy, that we could provide some of those resources that your public schools couldn't do with extra um, income, with raising funds, we raise an additional $2,200 per student per year in order to provide um, extracurricular activities, extended day classes, um, 26 Saturdays. Um, so that way, a child has all the resources necessary to achieve. Mm -hmm. We bring in parents. We bring in the community. And it, we want to talk about some of that, but some, but I want people to understand sure. it is a public school. It is a public school. It is a partnership, okay. public-private partnership with Newport News City Schools, public schools, and with Virginia Beach City Public Schools. Okay, so Mary, how did they decide that your school, SeaTac <laughs> Elementary, would be the first Virginia Beach school? I was thrilled when they could. Uh, there were two locations they were thinking about, the Tri-Campus in Virginia Beach and also SeaTac. Mm -hmm. Well, SeaTac was selected because we did not have a high mobility rate and also because of demographics and, and issues that we had in the community. Mobility rate meaning that the students are moving, don't, moving in, in and out because exactly. of the military, heavy military presence in the area? It or could just be period. military and other reasons, okay. economical issues. Mm -hmm. that yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. So... Are you, uh, uh, when they selected you as principal, when you're selecting the teachers and so forth, are you going through a different type of training? Um, what's different in terms of the delivery of this education? I wanted to reemphasize what Kim had said, too. We are a public school. This mm -hmm. is not a private school. Uh, the way I like to think about it is... Um, the ice cream is an ice cream cone. Virginia Beach City Public Schools is the ice cream and the cone. The sprinkles on top is our Title I program, <laughs> and that cherry on top is Achievable Dream. And it really complements and does everything with that. Uh, when we first knew that, we did have to go through um, a training process and an interview. When we um, developed our interview process, Achievable Dream came over and helped with the interview for the teachers. Mm -hmm. Once we had everyone on staff, we went through a week of training in July, and it was fabulous. What we got to do there was not just learn the history of Achievable Dream, but we got to bond with each other. We did activities. We learned the importance of the children. We began thinking of a, a mission statement and our vision and where we wanted to go. So there was a lot of in, intense training and a lot of uh, bonding. That is went there, and I can ask this of both of you, but sure. is there a certain type of, of teacher, a certain type of administrator that works best within an achievable dream um, um, framework? What makes them special, I guess, is what I'm asking. I'm looking for, and when we were looking yeah. for for teachers, it's mm -hmm. the same I was doing before Achievable Dream. We want someone that loves kids. 
-hmm. We want someone that wants to work with that population, with our population, because there are issues. Um, sometimes children come to us not knowing where, where they're going to put their head on the bed that night um, and they need to work with the child that wants to learn but does but has difficulty in learning so we're looking for those that are have a lot of energy that are not clock watchers they're willing to go above and beyond mm -hmm. and we are just really uh, fortunate in the fact that we have a lot have a lot of staff that were already Mm -hmm. on our staff that meet those criteria. So the students that are there now, um, the the K, mm -hmm. the school is K through two, second grade right now. Is that now, right? SeaTac Elementary is okay. K five. Okay. We began the Achievable Dream program with K two. Okay. Okay. And but, we'll add a we'll add a grade every year. So a grade will be added every year until Correct. you get to through elementary, then on to middle than on to high, to high school. Mr. Lawson, you have a um, daughter or a son? A daughter. A daughter who attends SeaTac Elementary? Yes, ma'am. And, and will be in the academy also? Yes, ma'am. Okay, what do you think <laughs> about it? I think it's the greatest thing that could happen to the kids. Okay. Not That's just mine, but all of them. Why? Well, simply because of the fact that the school system already teaches the kids exactly what they need. Achievable dreams on top of that goes th further to continue teaching kids, like they said before, the stuff that par kids' parents are already teaching them. Mm -hmm. Ethics, morals, things of that nature. I stress with my kids at home, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, no, sir, no, ma'am. The school, through Achievable Dreams, reiterates that. So it's a reinforcement as far as you're concerned. Yes, ma'am. Okay, but now we have to admit that there was some pushback initially from the SeaTac community um, right. regarding this. I want to bring join in the conversation um, to give us that community perspective is community activist Andrew Jackson. Andrew is a member of the African American Leadership Forum of Virginia Beach Think Tank and serves as an advisor to the SeaTac Civic League. Hi, Andrew. How are you? Good morning. How are you and how are your, your guests? Yeah, well, everybody's fine. Thank you so much for joining us. So initially, when the idea was floated um, through the SeaTac community, um, Andrew, uh, there was some pushback. And But explain from your perspective why, that, why the pushback. Okay, you got about a week? No. <laughs> no, I need you to no, get this into me, about a minute. <laughs> let, me, let me do this real quick, and I've been listening to some of the comments of your guests, and I'll get to those in a minute. Uh, first off, he, you, your statement just now was that it was floated through the community. No, it was not, and that's, that's an issue there. Uh, law and code were broken. There was no public meeting like there should have been to make some sort of decision before they signed a contract with these folks. If you well, call... Go if ahead. You, if you call it a, a public school, uh, then that means it's open to all students. That program is not open to all students, so it's not a public school. It, it, it's basically a charter school under another name. So one of the things that we look at is if, if this is so great, and, and I have, let me start with this, education to me is important. So I don't disagree with educating children. But if this is so great, then why was it kept so secret? Why were private meetings held? Why were secret meetings held? Why were uh, 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 certain parents notified by letter to come to the school? Why, why was there no opposition when, whenever there was a, uh, a, a parent meeting? Okay, so let me hold, hold on, Andrew, because you brought up several things here, and I want to make sure that we address each of those. Um, from my research, now I was not at the meetings, but from my research, there actually were public meetings and there were um, opportunities for parents to come out. Um, Mr. Larson James, were you invited? Did you know about public meetings? Yes, ma'am. About about um, the fact that the school was coming? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I, was, I was notified through flyers that came home with, I, I'd only, only have one kid at the school. Okay. At the time, I had three. Mm -hmm. One has since been promoted to junior high. But at that time, I was getting flyers coming home from all three of my kids. Mm -hmm. We also received phone calls through the school network that came to my phone informing me of these meetings. Okay. And this was before the actual decision was being made? Yes, ma'am. Okay. There, there okay. were several occasions okay. where we were notified of meetings to come to the school about Achievable Dreams. Okay. Before a decision was made. Okay. Kim, you want to respond to that also? Well, there are a number of opportunities for individuals uh, throughout the community 
to express any concerns. Um, it, it was not a private uh, meeting between the Virginia Beach City Public Schools and Achievable Dream. I will state that the Virginia Beach City Public Schools did come and approach an Achievable Dream about um, possibly uh, a partnership, mm -hmm. but it was open to the public. Um, and so uh, there was nothing uh, secretive or private about it let from our you, point of view. Let me ask you also, because that charter school thing sure. keeps coming up, that seems to be kind of the pushback from the community. How do you all address that? We are not a charter school. We do have a uh, partnership with the Virginia Beach City Public Schools. For SeaTac Elementary, those students are zoned to go to SeaTac. In Newport News, K through second grade are zoned to go to Dunbar Elementary, which is our academy. Anyone at once they reach the third grade can then um, apply to come to um, uh, and achieve a dream. And, and so, it's open the third, to, so it's open to the entire um, population, school population. That's at in Newport, the third in that's Newport, in Newport News. News. Okay. At some point, maybe that will occur in Virginia Beach. But right now in Virginia Beach, it is for those children who are zoned to the SeaTac school. And Mary, if a parent decides that they don't want to send their child to through this academy? Do they have an option? They can apply for um, out of zone and Bird Neck Elementary School is right across the street and they can attend there. Okay. Mr. Jackson, I wanted to ask you, I know that there is a very, very proud um, tradition in the SeaTac community, that it was um, one of the first African American um, neighborhoods. You all built schools. You 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 were very self sufficient and so forth. And I want to talk a little bit about that history. Um, and then I want to read something from an editorial that was in the Virginian Pilot um, for okay. you to react to. Go ahead. Okay, Barbara. First, let me let me just clarify something because okay. I heard. Uh, I mean, you're allowing four of them to talk, and I'm I'm trying to balance that. First off. Yes, there were meetings. There were private meetings because not everyone in the community was notified. There was notes sent home to specific parents. This contract that was signed with them was not signed at a, at a public school board meeting, which it should have been. There was a two-day notice when the law requires a 10-day notice. It was not signed at a regular uh, a public school uh, board meeting. It was signed at a retreat. And I've talked to several of the, the uh, board members. Some of them never even read the contract. There was a contract that was signed in, I think it was July or June. Mm -hmm. Most people didn't even know that that was happening, and it was signed without public consent. There was no public notice, no uh, formal meeting held in the school board. They violated the law. And so there you... was no sent home to the parents, but it was sent home to certain parents. And I remember when Dr. Uh, Daniel sent those notes home, and invited them because they usually have a little uh, something in the evening for, for the kids. And they invited those families, but they invited no one that was in opposition to that program that had any comments. And that's how they did that. They violated the law. They did it in secret. They did it at a retreat rather than a meeting. Now, the second thing is that uh, uh, these, these because you're going to talk about history, that neighborhood, you're absolutely correct. But SeaTac, that particular school, mm -hmm. that particular school is one of the historic schools. It was moved from where now the uh, uh, legal training academy is the, the, and was moved to the position it is now. But that was the first school that public, uh, uh, that uh, Negro children went to at that time, a, a formal public school that was a school. And that's a historic school. They picked that specific school. Now, for someone to say that all kids are, are open to that. It is not. They're going to have a, a, a specific number of children that will attend that program. All others will have to go out of zone to a school because they will, K through 2, they will not be able to go to that school if they are not in that program. That violates, then, equal choice. You don't have equal choice. You, it's, it's either in or out. Okay. And so public school, public school is a, is, a, is a guaranteed right. Equal public education. This is not the same. And I will challenge them on this. Let me let me ask you something, though, Andrew. And and, and I'm, I know that people are probably are a little bit confused because it seems to me that this program is actually a bonus for particularly kids who are are in impoverished 
neighborhoods and and are struggling and have all these other social issues as a way to address that and that that means that the community is taking charge of addressing a problem is that not the case yes now let me say this SeaTac, that neighborhood Mm -hmm. they've always been an achievable dream okay here's here's the issue I cannot say to one child, let me give you extras, and to the other child, business as usual. If we did the exact same thing, if we put our funds, our funding, instead of cutting education funding, if we put our funds there and and gave the same instructions to the teachers that are there, you could do the exact same thing. Okay, but what you have here is a profit-making organization, and I, we don't have time to okay. go into that. No, but and can, we don't, and we're okay. not, and, and you know what? Because because that's not the focus of our show yeah, exactly. today. And now I will say to you that uh, one of the things, and I don't remember which one said it. Maybe it's Doctor Daniels that they've learned the importance of children. Is that to say that they didn't know the importance of children in regular school? Okay, hold on one second, Andrew. If you're just joining us, we are talking about the newest addition to an Achievable Dream Academies, SeaTac Elementary and Achievable Dream Academy, with Kim Lucas, Vice President of Operations, uh, Principal Mary Daniels, and Parent James Lawson, along with um, Andrew Community Activist Andrew Jackson. If you'd like to join our conversation, the number is four four zero two six six five or one. 1-800-940-2240. Andrew, I, we only have a couple more minutes with you, but I want to ask you this. Are you more frustrated with the school board or with the program? The school board, because it is accountable to the people, the, all the taxpayers, not just the tacker, all the taxpayers, they're accountable to them. Mm-hmm. And I have my real concern here in some of the sub things that they're talking about they're going to teach. Uh, you know, I talked to, I, I visited the program. I went to Newport News. I, I watched them. Okay, I, I've gone through that, and I have some concerns about the differentiation between indoctrination and education. Okay, you can do a lot. You can do a lot with a child's man when they're when they're five, six, seven years old. You can do a lot with that, and I, I, I'm concerned about who is this person. Since I talked to one of them over Newport News, that's going to teach our kids culture. What okay. culture? All right. And so, uh, the, you know, when you say that special teachers that love kids, we don't have that in our school system now. And if not, why not? Okay. I'm going to have to let you go at this point, but I am going to ask our panelists to respond to a lot of the questions that you brought up because those are are, um, legitimate questions. Andrew Jackson, he is a community activist uh, and a member of the African American Leadership Forum of Virginia Beach Think Tank and serves as an advisor to the SeaTac Civic League. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us. Kim, let me ask you then, is, is it indoctrination? I mean, the military, there is a militaristic type of of um uh with the uniforms and the and having the military come in um and the handshaking and you know and all of that some people would see that as militaristic what's your response to that i would not characterize it the same way okay um i will tell you as the students come in each morning uh, they greet you with a handshake they smile they tell you um hi how are you they will. You ask them how they are. They will say fine. Um, they understand that this is about um, learning uh, how to engage in an environment uh, outside of home and sometimes at home. Um, what I do want everyone to know, though, is that an achievable dream provides an enriched curriculum. Um, an environment for learning. Um, We emphasize success. There is a respect for self and respect for others. Um, These children are able to develop meaningful relationships with adults. They are, uh, they take part in engaging enrichment activities uh, during the day, the academic day, and outside. We provide state-of-the-art technology. Um, We have an extensive extracurricular, experiential, and cultural activities. Um, Yes, they do go, they do have extended day. But what we can say, through these 22 years that Achievable Dream has been in existence, we do have a 100% on-time graduation rate. 100% of these kids, these students, 
go on to a two-year or four-year college, join the military, or enter a trade school. It, it, it is the success story. It is what they learn now and what they can take from now to be successful in the future. Let me let me bring something up too for for those who may not be aware of the demographics of the sure. students who attend an Achievable Dream Academy, uh, saying as the umbrella. Sure. Um, upon entry, 100% of these students qualify for free or reduced price lunch. 9% right. um, of students live in a guardian-led other than parents' households. 78% mm -hmm. live in single-parent households. And 98% of the students are African American. Um, let's go to Pamela in Williamsburg because she has a question that kind of leads from that information. Hi, Pam. You're on the air. Hello. I have a comment. I wish the program was available when I was a young person. It sounds as if it is targeted to uh, assist people who may be from certain socioeconomic environments that put them at disadvantages. And I'm really glad to hear that the program offers structure, it teaches them dignity, it seems to teach them respect for authority and for adults, and an awareness of themselves in addition to introducing culture and academics to them. I don't understand what the conflict is, and I'm having a difficult time understanding why there is a rejection of this. Is there a rejection because it is expected to identify a particular socioeconomic group? Is there a rejection because they're historically based? There's this push for public schools because there are some sort of financial issues connected to it. I don't understand why there was a re is a rejection of the program. I came up in a very difficult environment. I went to school in social work to address my issues. I went to Washington, D.C. I had to pretty much cultivate myself, and I wish that something like this had been available to me as a young person. I could have gotten started a lot earlier in the game. Okay, Pamela, so thank you. So why is there a pushback? Thank you so much for your question, and we will get, get to that. Let me ask you this, Mary, because I think that from what I'm, I'm trying to understand, there is, as we've been saying, a very, very proud history in SeaTac. I mean, they were able, these were, were free African Americans who built a community, had a lot of pride in that community, um, raised their children, you know, taught their children, yes. um, and so forth. Then you have an editorial that I'm going to read part, uh, part of from the Virginian Pilot, for example. Now, this came out on September 22nd of 2013, and it was talking about the fact that uh, the Achievable Dream Academy was coming to Virginia Beach. There is one paragraph that jumped out at me, and it says, quote, It is a proven way to change a child's culture, to provide what his community and family haven't, to help him become a productive, successful member of society. Now, if you're a parent or a, a resident of SeaTac, which has this rich history and so forth, and there's many, many parents, just like James Lawson here, who are already doing that, then can you see why this statement and why that type of conversation may upset some of the, the residents in SeaTac? I can certainly understand why that would make people concerned. Mm -hmm. But what I want to make sure everyone understands is we're not trying to change any culture at all. We are very, very proud of the culture of SeaTac Elementary school mm -hmm. and we honor that and we celebrate that we go to the parades the SeaTac community has an annual parade to celebrate that community we go every year as a school to represent that we guard jealously the history and the culture of our community. So that is incorporated then in the curriculum, in the social etiquette, the social part, the morals part, etc. Absolutely. The, the part that we are going to be enhancing through the same is the type of things we would have no matter what culture you are in. Um, it's exciting to watch the children with the smiles on their faces and understanding that, yes, I am important. I, I can do this. Mm -hmm. I will do this. James, are you concerned? The, Mr. Uh, Mr. Jackson said indoctrination. Do you think that's a, a, a tough term? Uh, yes, ma'am, I do. Uh, I really believe that that term is used out of context. Mm -hmm. From what I've seen of the achievable dream and the fact that I am prior military, it gives me great pride to see that our military members are out there 
getting involved in the local schools, mm -hmm. giving the kids a pride and something to look forward to further on down the line in their lives. I don't know any little kid that doesn't see someone in uniform, whether it be a police officer, a firefighter, somebody in the military, and doesn't look at him like, wow, I want to do that when I grow up. And and the statistics are that only only 5% of the students go into the military. I mean, the vast majority go on to um, higher education, to, That's to, to college and so forth. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. Kim, since everybody's been talking about this whole military thing, I get, I get why. Because when I was there, and I've had the privilege of speaking to students at both the elementary school and the middle school and, mm -hmm. and they were just great but the the other thing that the elementary school principal told me was that in, uh, even more than you know getting them to look you in the eye and shake your hand which is a skill that we have to have in order to be successful in this world that it also gives the teachers an opportunity to connect with that child who may have had a really bad night or who exactly. may not have had breakfast that that morning or whose, you know, situation, whatever it is, um, may not be conducive to them learning for that day. And it's more of an intervention tactic. Is that? That's so true. Um, as they enter uh, the school, uh, usually there, you may have the principal, Mary may be there, you'll have teachers, you'll have individuals throughout the business community. And they're there and they, they'll shake hands, but you do have an opportunity to look at the child, to talk to the child. You'll be able to see what their expressions are. You can tell um, whether or not they've had some difficulty and you're able to address that right then and there and ensure that that child's day starts as best it can that makes he or she able to learn. I think those are all of the added value pieces of an achievable dream. I do want to address the one thing that um, Mr. Andrews uh, stated, um, an achievable dream is a 501c3. We are a nonprofit, not a for-profit organization. Mm -hmm. We raise monies for the program and for the schools. That's how these our students are able to go on 95 field trips in one year. That's how we are able to ensure that there is an extended day that helps students. Uh, either they, uh, they need extra learning, extra skills. That's how we're able to have all of these other programs. So we raise funds for the program and for the schools. Mm -hmm. It is not a for-profit organization. And so now Virginia Beach will raise funds um, so that SeaTac and Achievable Correct. Dream Academy can continue Correct. to do those same things. Is it your goal um, from the overall Achievable uh, Dream Academies to place this program in all schools at some point? We would love for that to happen. Um, it does take a community. It takes a business community. Um, it takes outside funds in order for us to ensure that that education and those extracurriculars are available. Um, I think that it has proven successes that you can't find in most public schools and you're not necessarily going to find in a private education. So uh, it's the added value. Okay, let's go to Diana in Newport News. Hi, Diana, you're on the air. Hi. I'm Hi. also wondering, are these children being taught a historical perspective relative their, to their culture and African American uh, uh, Afrocentric cultural perspective, historical perspective, so that they aren't uh, completely detached from their uh, history and their culture and their familial environment once they return to their environment? Um, I think that's very important. Um, I, I get concerned when I see African American children being, and I hate to use the word indoctrinated, but indoctrinated into a culture that focuses on everything except that, which sometimes can lead to rejection of your culture, of yourself. And I'm wondering if that indoctrination is included in Afrocentric indoctrination. And it, it's militaristic in its, in its form, if it's overly structured, 
uh, is there something creative that's also introduced so that they aren't so streamlined into the military and the police force? Okay, because that can be very narrow. Okay, thank you so much for your call, Diana. And I, I, I want to make clear to everybody, it is really <laughs> the the military comes in and and they're there. The police department comes in. The sheriffs come in also. But it's it's an opportunity for the kids to show that they have dressed in their uniform properly, that they are proud of what they're doing. So I don't want people to think that they're marching people down the hallway, you know, and, and making them, <laughs> you know, do military drills. That's not the case. However, um, in Virginia Beach public schools or any public schools for that matter, do you think that there was already a lack of teaching of African-American history? Mary, we, so so why why would you be any different? In other words, um, we are a Virginia Beach City Public Schools, and we follow the curriculum of Virginia Beach City Public Schools. Mm -hmm. None of that has changed, nor will it change. Uh, the history we have, the social studies we have, all of that. We do bring in all cultures when we are talking historically, not just African American. We bring in uh, female history. We bring in Hispanic history. All of that is included in our curriculum. Mm -hmm. Mr. J Lawson, how are you going to stay involved? Is, is there a parent component to this? Did you have to do anything special in terms of being a part of the academy? Uh, not really. I don't have to do anything special. Me personally, I stay involved with the kids at SeaTac, probably more so than Miss Miss Daniels would like me to be. <laughs> no, I disagree with that. <laughs> but I, I actually spend a lot of time at the school. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to say this this past school year, I probably spent sixty or seventy hours up there at the school helping out with the kids, with Doctor Daniels, with the mm -hmm. with the teachers. I spend a lot of time up there. Mm -hmm. I strongly believe in in the education of all the kids not just my own i spend more time up there talking to and helping out with other kids my kids typically see me just in passing <laughs> and they probably are like oh lord there's dad again <laughs> yeah yeah they, they, they tend to do that did you have to sign a, a, a pledge or a contract and there's some kind of parent contract that goes along with this yes ma'am okay and what does that contract say what does it require you to do basically and more worse than not, it pretty much requires the parents to help the kids on a daily basis to do exactly what they need to do at the school. Mm -hmm. Helping them out in the morning, making sure that their clothes are on correctly, that they have clean clothes, getting breakfast, getting to school with that right attitude to start the day off with in the first place. Mm -hmm. Is there a component to helping those parents that may need help? In doing exactly what that contract says? I mean, do you talk with, have, I don't know, parenting classes or things of that nature, Kim? Um, well, we do have a, a PTA, and I will say that in uh, Newport News, and I'm, I'm sure this will be the case in Virginia Beach, we have about 100% um, attendance at our PTA meetings from our parents. Um, parents are invited wow. to every event. We just had the induction ceremony in Virginia Beach, and it was wonderful. Parents were there. They saw um, just in one week um, what their children learned and, and how they are being, um, I guess, engaged in the, the new school process. In Newport News, because we've been doing it for the last 20 some odd years, it was phenomenal. How many parents? So what you have is not just the children, but the parents do become a part of the learning process. Mm -hmm. um, yes, we also offer wraparound services. I mean, as you stated earlier, um, we have children at any given time, seven to nine percent of our children are homeless. Or you have families who um, their electricity might be uh, turned off. We do everything we can as an achievable dream to, to help them to ensure that um, the electricity is turned back on. So they can They're get homeless. the right resources that they need. We, 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 um, we have engagement partnerships with uh, social service agencies. Um, so, and then our business community, because they help us and they provide financial um, uh, funding for us, um, 
we also are able to ask them to help. And many of them are presidents and CEOs of many of these uh, companies and, mm -hmm. and agencies. So it's a, I don't want anyone to take away from this that it is so structured that a child um, is indoctrinated. That is not the case. It is, an, it offers an, an opportunity for the child, the parent, and the family to really get to know the police, to get to know um, the sheriff's department. And it gives them an opportunity, the, the, those police and military and sheriffs and Navy, to get to know the child and the family too. And so it is a truly a family environment. It is about the whole child and ensuring that we are able to educate that child. So, uh, Mary, you just had your, um, um, I can't think of the name of it. Intercession. intercession. Thank yes. you. Your intercession where the kids, um, and which is every child has talked about with this in terms of the summertime lag, as they say. And, mm -hmm. and so they're back in to start re-engaging re in school and so forth. It was successful? It was phenomenal. I wish you could have been there every <laughs> single day day it wasn't just the the important thing too is we had little kindergartners never been in school mm -hmm. before we had over 45 that did attend and they came in they got to see the building they got to meet the teacher and the teacher that they had during intercession will be the teacher they will have this coming school year so the benefits were twofold number one the child got to know their teacher and really began that bonding process okay. and on the other other hand mm -hmm. the teacher got to know the child and the what parents. their learning style was mm -hmm. and uh, what how they learn best what their uh, issues may or may not be and to begin that learning early so that when school begins in September They've gotten a they're lot of the go. other stuff Absolutely. and they're ready to move. Believe it or not, we are out of time. Oh. <laughs> but I wish you all all the very best um, this school year and we'll do an update and we'll come back and find out what's going on. James Lawson, a resident uh, and a parent of the SeaTac Virginia B SeaTac and Achievable Dream Academy, Kim Lucas. <laughs> The, a lot. <laughs> I know it is. The Vice President of Operations and Ms. Mary Daniels, the principal. Thank you so much for joining us, and we will be right back. Hello, this is Spike Lee. What's happening? And you listen to Another View, 89.5 FM on WHRV. Thank you, Spike Lee. That's very, very cool. Our next story is part of WHRO's Veterans Initiative. WHRO is engaging the community to help support veterans as they transition to civilian life in Hampton Roads. To find out more, visit whro.org slash veterans. She's described as someone who always gave herself to causes while offering quality leadership. At least that's how the brother of Major Charity Adams describes his sister. Adams is recognized as the highest ranking African American female officer during World War II and led a battalion of more than 800 African American women. Our Lisa Godley has the story of Adams and the 6888 Postal Battalion. American soldiers had been fighting in World War II more than a year when Major Charity Adams was told to board a plane heading for Europe, her mission purposely withheld. She and her adjutant were on the plane and had to open the orders after they were far enough out over the sea that they wouldn't be turning back. Her son, Stanley Early, goes on to say that years earlier, his mother had joined the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps and was in the first class to undergo officer training. And with her last name, Adams, she would go down in history as the first African-American female officer commissioned. She went over with basically individuals and 
equipment that was important, spare parts and so forth, and arrived there uh, December 16, 44, which the same day the Battle of the Bulge started. Major Charity Adams would assume command of the 6888 Postal Battalion. Their service was desperately needed. The mail delivery to the millions of American soldiers fighting overseas had stagnated, and it was affecting morale. Her daughter, Judy Early, says it was her mom's assignment to fix it. I know that when she started at the 6888, they really had no expectations that the job was really going to get done because they had such a backlog of mail and had not been able to get delivered. Like help! The battalion consisted of more than 800 African-American women of different ages and backgrounds. The thing that I remember more was there was such a variety of occupations and educational levels. There were women who were career women and had decided to make this change. There were women that were just starting out. There were teachers and nurses and hairdressers and store clerks. And there was just such a variety of people from all walks of life that decided that they wanted to uh, join the service. Adams knew they had their work cut out for them. She devised a plan to work her troops in three eight-hour shifts. This was strongly criticized by white male officers who argued that it wasn't the way they would do it, so therefore it wasn't the way it should be done. Most weren't accustomed to women in the military, and they really had a problem with African-American women being a part of the service, especially seeing one in charge. Using the women to work in shifts, they managed to clear out all of that backlog mail and get it delivered and uh, get everything back on schedule. And that's part of her gift of leadership was that she organized it and got it done much faster than they expected. There was no fanfare when the women returned to the United States. Their mission accomplished. Her brother, Bishop John Adams, remembers well the pre-civil rights climate when his sister returned home to Columbia, South Carolina. The white soldiers had a very difficult time saluting not only this black person, but a black woman. And we used to uh, enjoy walking down Main Street in Columbia, where all the officers uh, and soldiers operated and enjoyed to see the look on the faces of many people when they had to salute this black woman. Decades would pass before Lieutenant Colonel Charity Adams and the women of the 6888 received the recognition they deserved, which included meeting President Bill Clinton in 1995. Her family says she was extremely pleased when the 6888's work was recognized. But even after her service to the country ended, Charity Adams' service to her community continued, serving on various boards of colleges, utilities, and authorities. Her son says his mother's acute attention to detail was evident in everything she did. The great power she had was she read absolutely everything. So she would go into a meeting and she'd know all of the issues and all the material. And when you go into a meeting, almost nobody's ever done that. Charity Adams Early passed away in 2002. The Charity Adams Early Academy for Girls in Dayton, Ohio, is named in her honor. For Another View, I'm Lisa Godley. Just another example of how black history is America's history. That is fantastic. And that's our show for today. If you'd like to hear it again or share it with a friend, visit anotherviewradio.org and download the podcast. Next week, Another View on Health looks at sleep apnea. Our experts will help you get a good night's sleep. Our theme music was composed and produced by Jay Sennett. Lisa Godley is our show producer. Victor Bowen is our audio engineer, and Frank Bilasali, who is our intern extraordinaire. Today is his last day with us, and he answered our phones, and we are so proud of him, and we welcome him back anytime. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Make a great weekend, everyone. Everyone have a fabulous weekend, and let's get together again next Friday at noon for another view.